words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It is Trinity Sunday today, as well as the day before Memorial Day. And on this day, we honor our mysterious, often confusing, fully integrated, immensely powerful, three-in-one, <laughs> essential God. I found out in seminary that we have to be very careful about how we talk about the Trinity, because whatever assertion we make, pretty likely to be wrong. In fact, the basic writings on the Trinity seem to me to kind of dance around the issue and hardly ever point at it, hardly ever try to take it head on. And, and me, I'm the kind of pastor who likes to read a passage and get to the nitty gritty to the basics of it. And uh, it's been really hard for the Trinity. The last, uh, two years ago, I believe it was, uh, you know, every year this comes up. It's like seven or eight weeks after uh, after Easter, and this is this is the one past the one time in the year I really have a lot of trouble putting together a sermon. So a lot of times I will talk to other pastors about this situation, and uh, I talked to Pastor Wright about this about two years ago, and he gave me a really good analogy, and uh, I actually used it uh, at the time. And he, uh, we talked about the Trinity as being like three in one oil. And uh, so, you know, it's one oil, but it does three things. It cleans, it lubricates, and it protects. So that, you know, that's great. And I thought, well, I used that two years ago. You might not remember that. You probably don't. Uh, I had to look it up to make sure that I didn't remember it. And uh, so, um, so I thought, I'll, I'll come up with another analogy. So night after night, you know, I usually wake up at 5 in the morning and always thinking about you know, the sermon right about that time, what I'm going to talk about. And I thought, here's a good idea. I'll compare the Trinity to a cell phone. You know, there's lots of apps on it. Uh, you can do all kinds of different things with it. And, and the more I thought about it, the more that analogy started to break down. And I thought, well, it's not exactly like the Trinity. But I think the cell phone is a good example of how we don't understand the Trinity. <laughs> because, you know, um, if we're just not, I believe, spiritually advanced enough to figure out exactly what the Trinity is, even theologians have been working on this for, you know, for centuries, uh, in fact, about 20 centuries, and they still haven't got it quite nailed down. They're still arguing about it, and we talk about those arguments in seminary. But I thought, so, kind of like the cell phone, imagine, you know, you were trying to explain the cell phone to Moses, uh, you know, right there when the Ten Commandments were, be, were give, being given from uh, Mount Ararat, right? Well, you know, you could tell them, you know, instead of waking everybody up with a trumpet, or, 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 you know, <laughs> you, can, you can set the alarm on the cell phones for everybody. You know, instead of having everyone come to this Moki Mountain, you know, where they're all breathing in this, this this terrible air and listening to these loud rumbling noises, we have a Zoom meeting and we could, uh, you know, do it on our cell phones. And you know, instead of ch -ch 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 chiseling that rock and all the trouble, I mean, you know, and then having the rock break on you as you're taking it down the mountain, why not? Why not? text everybody, and then they got it on their phone, so yeah, it's all under control, right? Well, what do you think those people would say when you, when they, when you, when they heard you telling them that? They would be saying, none of that makes any sense. And you know, it wouldn't have been as effective as the way it happened anyway. But so that's where we're at. You know, they don't understand, they could never have understood our technology at that point. But we are still spiritually backward as human beings enough that we can't understand you know, some of these higher concepts of God. And so I kind of wanted to get that across and re make you realize how hard it is you know, to discuss this Trinity issue, but I'm going to do my best to do it. <clears throat> so what do we understand about the Trinity? Theologians in the church have pondered long and hard on the nature of God, and the upshot of the conjecture seems to be a 
general concession, uh, con consensus among Christians that there are three persons, one substance in God, and that is the Trinity. So why do we think that there just must be one God? What, what in the Bible tells us that? And if you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4, uh, there, there is a passage there where Moses is talking to the Israelites. They're standing on the banks of the River Jordan, and they're just getting ready to cross into the Promised Land. Well, he can't go, so he's given them all this advice. And one of the things that he says before they leave him there on the mountain is, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eheinu Adonai. <laughs> And uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's the Hebrew. <laughs> and what he said in English is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. But what's interesting about this, and the reason I read it in the Hebrew, is is Elihu actually is both plural and singular. It can mean God or gods. So right there at the beginning, we have this this interesting fusion of many gods in one God. But it's not many gods in one God. It's many persons in one God. And they didn't quite have a clarity on that at that time. But this is a foundational statement for us and for the uh, Judaism that there can only be one God. And that is our God. But in many places, even in the Old Testament, we see the three persons together doing things right there in the beginning, in the book of Genesis. You know, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, first thing we find out is the Spirit is hovering over the waters. And then there's God there. And what does God do? God says, let there be light, right? And so there is light. So what do we have? We know the Spirit's there because the Spirit's hovering over the water. We know God's there because God is speaking, right? Speaking light into existence. But when God speaks, God is speaking with the Word. And what is the Word? We know from the Gospel of John, right there in the beginning, first verse, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here we got Jesus there at the same time. So there we have the three persons right there, right there in the beginning. And there's other places in the Old Testament that we can see that. And then in the New Testament, we've got that same dynamic going on. If you think about when Jesus goes to get baptized by John the Baptist, what happens? Jesus goes, uh, goes down to the river. And what happens? The sky opens up. God is there. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And a dove comes down out of the heavens. And when that dove comes down, that's the Spirit. So we've got Jesus, God, and the Spirit all there at once. And we know that Jesus is the same as God because it says it any number of times in the New Testament if you read through it. But this is just one example. And this is from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 58. It says, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And I am, who is that? You know, God. Yahweh, right? It's God. So Jesus is God. And so our passage for today, John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, very well known for two sections that are in it. And the first part is the part about being born again. Right? And being born again, not just born again, but born again in the Spirit, as Jesus makes quite clear to Nicodemus. In verses 5 through 8, Jesus talks to Nicodemus and he tells him that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they were born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You must be born again. The second part is perhaps the most famous verse in the entire New Testament. And I'm sure you've seen it, you know, a lot of times you'll see it uh, on a sign, maybe at a football game or a car race or something. And all it says is John 3.16, you know. And, and you're, if, if, if you're more or less expected to know exactly what that is. But the first time I saw it, I had to look it up and find out what it was. It says, for God so loved the world 
And he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So in this long passage, we've got all three persons of the Trinity, don't we? You know, the Spirit, pointing into the Spirit. We've got uh, Jesus there, and we've got God there, all in those two passages. And I think these passages can give us some insight into the whole concept of the Trinity and just who those three persons are that we have been talking about. Or should I say, those three persons is. See? <laughs> Sometimes it's hard, hard to figure out how to even talk about the Trinity. Is the Trinity an is or is the Trinity an are? I don't know, is it plural or is it singular? <clears throat> and, and as you know, that one passage from Deuteronomy shows us, it can be a little difficult to, to figure it out. <clears throat> so note that when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, the Spirit is a life force. When God breathed life into humanity, you know, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, for those of you who are taking notes, and I think that's all of you at this point. Uh, it was the Spirit. The Spirit, I think, is a life force in more than simply death, right? But conceptually and emotionally as well. It's like a flaming, a flame kindling a fire. We have you know, the basics within us, but it takes the Spirit to get that going. God is working with us. It is then that we are able to work for God in the world. And I think this is part of the meaning of that passage. You know, the Spirit kindles within us that fire that is potential in us all of the time. So the spirit is an integral part of who God is, not an aspect of God, not a being separate from God, but God in God's essence. I think the spirit is God's activity in the world through us. It's part of it. <clears throat> Jesus is also God in God's essence. The same God who is the spirit acted, in fact, acts now and always will be acting to save humanity. We are used to thinking of Jesus making the kingdom of God known by his parables and in stories, through his actions and healings, but it is not just the kingdom of God that's being made known. What else is being made known by Jesus Christ is God in God's self, because Jesus is the image of God. We are made in the image of God, right? But Jesus is the perfect image of God. So, <clears throat> if we are made in the image of God, imagine how much more so Jesus is made in the image of God, a separate being, but the very being of God in God's self. So when we hear Jesus say that God so loved the world, he sent his one and only Son, I think it is the word love that is operative at that point. And it is that word that we should be focused on. And if you think about it, there's something called the atonement. And that's when Jesus goes to the cross. Jesus goes to the cross. Why does Jesus go to the cross? To save us from our sins? Yes, but the real reason behind that is that Jesus loved us. Jesus loves us, and God loves us too. And so... In my mind, okay, we've got the Spirit, which is God's activity in the world. Jesus is God's love in the world. So we can describe the Spirit as God's activity, but through three, John 3.16, we can describe Jesus as God's love. And all this is to say that the three persons of the Trinity are not separate beings with different functions within an economic and physical construct that we call the universe. Rather, I think the Trinity demonstrates that one God, Moses, spoke of to the crowds that were ready to cross that Jordan River. That one God, as they were ready to go into the Promised Land, Moses is telling them there is one God, is a powerful and active God. One who loves not just those people, but loves us all, all people and continues to work through history to bring us all closer and closer to God in an ultimate sense.
God's peaceable kingdom here on earth, a new heaven and a new earth brought together. Amen.